check, 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 check. Okay, I think we are good, actually. Can you guys uh, hear me? Let me get uh, what what from the <laughs> chat. Oh. Okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't realize I was checking live. All right, uh, so we are live. Uh, I think you guys probably know the drill by now. Uh, we're on episode six. This one's about Aristotle, Kant, and evolution. John Verveke. Um, what else do we have to cover here? All the information is always scrolling in the bottom. So um, if I forget to say anything, uh, just check the information there. I recognize the chat's a little screwed up right now, the way it's displaying. So I'm going to try and fix that during the live stream. So yeah. Yeah, the video discussion will start after the live stream, which is in about one hour. Uh, we will post a link in the chat where you guys can join. It's on a first come, first serve basis. And then after the video finishes, we'll post the link, then we'll take a 10 minute intermission, and then we'll be at the discussion, which will be live streamed in the same window. So, yeah, so basically it. just just chill. After the uh, Verveki thing is finished, uh, just hang out and uh, we will take a short intermission and then be back with the video. Mm -hmm. Let's All get right. Started. Welcome back to, uh, to Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. So last time we discussed the important uh, and foundational work of Plato. Uh, the grammar of Western civilization is basically made up uh, of the, the Bible and Plato. Uh, we'll, we'll keep coming back to both of those uh, uh, repeatedly in certain ways. And we talked about uh, Plato's notion of wisdom and how it involved this process of aligning uh, the psyche so as to reduce uh, inner conflict and reduce self-deception uh, by bullshitting ourselves and that how that enabled us to also achieve one of our meta desires, the desire for inner peace, but how we could also align that reduction in self-deception with getting uh, more in contact with what's real and that as we practice tracking real patterns in the world, we could then reflectively internalize that back on ourselves. And there was an intimate connection between how we knew the world and knew ourselves. And as we increased our ability to pick up on real patterns, we could increase our self-knowledge, reduce our self-deception, increase our contact with reality, and that would flow in the process of anagoge. And that would bring about the satisfaction of our second meta-desire, which is to be in contact with realness. And so Plato has this idea of wisdom as this anagogic process, and we talked about that in, in a connection with his great parable, uh, the parable of the cave. I then pointed out that uh, he had, uh, just as Socrates was lucky to have a great disciple in Plato, uh, Plato was lucky to have a great disciple in Aristotle. And Aristotle is pivotal for us because he lays the foundation uh, for it, uh, further uh, aspects of a scientific approach uh, to wisdom and meaning and also for an important uh, uh, formulation uh, of one of the ways in which we deeply connect the self to reality that we're going to talk about when we talk about worldview attunement. So as I mentioned, Aristotle was a student of Plato. He studies with Plato for about 20 years. Uh, and then at some point he breaks away from Plato famously cla claiming that while I love Plato, I love the truth more. Uh, Aristotle uh, remained, and many people would argue this, uh, Gerson for example and others, that uh, Aristotle remains in, s in some very important senses a Platonist, but there was an aspect of Plato's work that Aristotle uh, thought was uh, lacking. Plato did not really adequately account for change. So Aristotle was deeply influenced by Plato's account of what made for something real for us, but he thought that Plato wasn't 
could not really explain uh, change very well, and he was going to invent some very important concepts that are going to become integral to our understanding of what it is uh, to be meaningfully connected to reality. Now, Aristotle is very influenced by his uh, father, who is a physician. He's much more of a biologist than a mathematician, so while Plato is much more uh, prone to using mathematical analogies, uh, uh, Aristotle is much more used to uh, using biological analogies. And the word that Aristotle uses for change is actually better translated as growth or development. Aristotle was really interested in how living things grow, how they develop. And that should, that should prick up your ears right away because part of, I take it, what we often mean when we say we have a meaningful life is that we are growing or developing. In fact, people will often use the word growth as a way of indicating an improvement in the meaning of their life and in some sense the developing of wisdom. So Aristotle picks up on Plato's notion of the eidos. So if you remember last time we talked about this. We talked about th that a bird is much more than a set of its features. It's not just a beak, it's not just some feathers. It's this gestalt, it's that structural, functional organization such that all the parts function together as a whole and so that what you have is something that acts as a bird. And that pattern, that logos, that eidos, is very hard actually to put into words, but it's very much what does two things for us. It's what makes a bird a bird and it's also the pattern by which we come to know what a bird is. When we can grasp the structural functional organization, that eidos, then we understand what a bird is. Now Aristotle was uh, very impressed by that, but he wanted to give it a more dynamical approach. He wanted to talk about it in terms of development. And so he was very interested, as I said, in how things grow. And he noted the role that form had in growth and development. So he, what he did was he first started by an analogy. So he would use the analogy of artifacts, human-made things, and then use that to try and understand biological things. So for example, I can have a block of wood, right, and I can make it into a chair or perhaps a table or if it's a big enough amount of wood, I can make it into a ship or a boat. And Aristotle asked, what makes the wood behave like a chair as opposed to a table or to a ship? And this is where we get the notion of actuality from. We often use the word actuality, in fact, as a way of talking about realness. It's an actual something, as a way of saying it's a real something, as opposed to a fraud or a simulation. So, what makes a chair act like a chair? Why does the wood act like a chair here, act like a table here, and act like a ship here? And so Aristotle said, well, first of all, this is important change, and it's a good analogy for development. When I'm making a chair, that's somehow analogous for how an organism is growing. So what is it? that makes the wood act like a chair here and act like a table here. And his argument was, well, it's the form. Again, where this means eidos, not shape, although you can use shape as an analogy. This is the structural functional organization. The wood is structurally functionally organized in such a way that it will act like a chair, whereas here it will act like a table and here it will act like a ship. Now, Aristotle's point is that this doesn't, it's not that this doesn't play any role, but he invents this really important idea. He invents the idea that the wood is potential. These terms, actual and potential, actually come from Aristotle. We use them every day. We think they're just part of our natural grammar, but they're actually an invention of Aristotle. We're going to see how important uh, they are. So the idea is wood is potentially a chair, Wood is potentially a table. Wood is potentially a ship. Now, when that potential has a particular form given to it, then it starts acting like a chair. It starts acting like a table and acting like a ship. And this is where we get the notion of information from. You put a form into something, 
and you will actualize its potential. Namely, you will give it a structural functional organization so it will start to act in a particular manner. Now, that's really important. And then what Aristotle argued is, well, what you see in living things is that they are basically doing this for themselves. So if you'll use, I just mean this as an analogy, a living thing is like a chair that is making itself. A chair, imagine that a chair could somehow start to impose a structural functional organization on wood so that it started to turn itself into a chair. That's what a living thing does. I mean, you, you, food. Food is potential you. You put food into you, you inform it. There is a code in your DNA that ultimately puts a particular form in it that gives it a structural functional organization that becomes you. Now, of course, this unfolds across time. It's, it, it's not, it not, doesn't happen like that, and that's why we see it as change and development. Now, this is really Im important, uh, as we'll see, because it's going to be foundational to understanding a lot about how you connect to the world. So, how are we going to make use of this uh, in talking about the way human beings are connected to reality, the way they develop and grow as cognitive agents? So what I want to do first is to step aside from Aristotle in the Axial Age and move into current cognitive science and talk about an important uh, way of thinking about development and change, uh, especially uh, the work of Alicia Uraro that was directly and explicitly inspired by this Aristotelian framework. So when we talk about how things change, right? We often have a model that we inherited from the scientific revolution, a model we get from Newton. And this is a model that change occurs because of causal impact. So the standard thing, here's this marker, right? I press it. Why did it move? It moved because I pushed it. It seems so obvious and non-controversial, right? So we give an explanation what causes it to be because it was pushed. It was the, and the idea of all uh, change and development is there's an event A, and it somehow right, causes event B, causes event C. Event A precedes B, makes B happen, and then B precedes C, and B makes C happen. So as Newton was engaging in the scientific revolution, this notion of how things happen was becoming prominent in him um, and for uh, the people that was going to take up the Newtonian worldview. Now, what was very interesting about that, right, is that this seemed to solve a lot of problems. And this was brought out by a famous philosopher, Immanuel Kant, who Alicia Uraro talks about. Kant was interested in why was this Newtonian model becoming so successful. The Aristotelian model had been around for thousands of years. Why was Newton's model overtaking it so rapidly? And what Kant said is, well, this does something very wonderful for us. Because what it does is gives us a very simple account of how we explain things. I explain C by showing you how it was preceded by an event B that caused it and how B was preceded by an event A that caused it. Very nice, linear, clean, and we, like, and it seems to, isn't that what's happening? It's so obvious, right? And again, remember, again and again, I've tried to show you things that seem so obvious, so natural, are actually historical creations. You have to pay attention to how we got where we are. Now, why does this matter? Well, because this prevents a, a, a kind of, um, vacuous explanation that can occur. This prevents what are called circular explanations. This line, right, prevents circular explanations. Okay, so a circular explanation is when you assume the very thing you're trying to explain in your explanation. So 
Here's a standard kind of model. People often use this without realizing it. You know, there's a triangle out here in the world. The light comes in into my eye. It goes through nerve pulses. That goes into my consciousness, right? It's somehow projected onto an inner screen. And then there's a triangle there. And then there's a little man inside. And he goes, triangle, right? And we have updated versions of this, like the central executive and such, right? This is called a homuncular theory. Homunculus means a little man. Now, when you present it like that, I hope you can all see why this is obviously useless. Because what you should then ask is, well, how does the little man see the little triangle inside? And then what you go is, well, inside the little man's head, there's an even smaller screen with a littler man going triangle. But how does he see? The triangle, triangle. You, you see what this is. It's an infinite regress. Because you're actually using vision to try and explain vision. Now please remember this notion of a homuncular fallacy, because that's what this is, because while it's easy to explain, I need you to understand that we fall into it very often when we try and understand and explain ourselves. Okay, that is a circular explanation, because you're using the very thing you're trying to explain in order to explain it. Kant said this Newtonian scheme is wonderful because if you stick to its grammar, if you stick to its rules, the cause has to be an independent event that proceeds, right? Then you don't fall into circular explanations. That's amazing. Now, you, you've got some problems here. What started it all, right? Right? And, you know, maybe God, and then Kant says no, and he's got all his arguments, and I'm not going to get into that right now. Suffice it to say that this became a predominant way of trying to explain how things work. But then Kant encountered a very significant problem. And it's, it's, and it's not a coincidence that it has to do with the kinds of things we were talking about with Aristotle, the kinds of things that can grow, living things. Because Kant went out and he saw a tree, right? And this was very problematic for him because trees don't follow this model readily. Because he was looking at it and he was saying, okay, well, what's making the tree. Well, it's the sunlight. Well, how does the sunlight get in? Through the leaves. So, right, what's making the leaves? Well, the tree. So the tree makes the leaves and the leaves make the tree, so the tree is making the tree. And he coined the term self-organizing. The tree is self-organizing. Now the problem with that is Right? Living things make use of feedback cycles. In a feedback cycle, the output from the system feeds back into the system. The tree makes the leaves, that gathers energy, that goes into the processes that makes the leaves. Living things are self-organizing. They use feedback cycles. But when I try and give an explanation of a feedback cycle, I fall into a circular explanation. I fall into a circular explanation. And so Kant came to a rather startling conclusion. He came to the conclusion that there could not be a science of living things, that biology was impossible. Now Kant is, one, one, uh, is a towering intellect. He's a, like, he's a genius, a philosophical genius. And so you can't just sort of dismiss that. You can't, well, there obviously is biology. What an idiot Kant is. No, no. You're the one who needs to step back and think, where's the mistake in the argument? Because if there is biology, and it's true that there is, and I agree that there is, right, and that living things use feedback cycles, which they necessarily do, they're self-organizing, which they necessarily are, and when I try and trace out the causation, I get into circular explanation, which seems like a necessary thing, and circular explanations are vacuous and empty, then where is Kant going wrong? And this is what uh, Alicia Uraro takes up. And she said, actually, for a very long time, we had no way of solving this problem. And so there was a huge gap between our biology and our physics. Now again, why are we caring about this? Because we need to, if we're going to understand Aristotle, if we're going to deeply understand what we mean when we talk about that we are 
living things that grow and develop, and that growth and development is integral to our meaning and our sense of who and what we are, our personal identity, that if we cannot give an answer to this problem, we cannot understand fundamentally who and what we are and what the hell we are talking about when we talk about how important growth and development are to us. Because that language will forever be separate from any kind of scientific understanding. So, where is this going wrong? This seems just non like living things are feedback cycles, self organizing. They grow, they develop, they, they make themselves. Right? So, what, what has to go? Well, this. Now, before you jump and say, but that's just, that's just what causation is. Think about the fact that we know, we actually know that Newton's ultimately wrong, right? Newton doesn't work with relativity. Newton doesn't work at the quantum level. So we know that we shouldn't be absolutely committed to this view. Now, Uraro actually makes use of an important idea from Aristotle to solve this problem. So, she's going to use Aristotle in order to explain a, a new and powerful way of talking about growth and development and self-organizing processes, which is known as dynamical systems theory. So, Uraro, first of all, makes a distinction between causes and constraints. So to get at that distinction, let's go back to what seems so obvious. Okay, here's the marker. I push it, why did it move? And immediately, the Newtonian grammar just comes into place. It moved because you pushed it. And then you might step out, outside of physics and say, well, I wanted to push it, and, but that's, that's not what I'm asking. Because it, right? it could also just be that some other object bumped into this and it moved. Why else did it move? Okay, so think about what has to also be true in order for this to move. There has to be empty space, relatively empty space in front of the marker. This has to have a particular shape to it. This has to have a particular shape to it. Right? Those aren't events. Right? Those are conditions. Causes are events that make things happen. Constraints, right, aren't events, they're conditions. They don't make things happen, they make things possible. And there's a big difference between a condition and an event. The Newtonian way of thinking has us so fixated on this, so foregrounded on this, that we're not seeing this anymore. You see, Aristotle because of his platonic view, actually considers this more important. Why? Because when I talk about a structural, functional organization, when I talk about a pattern, I'm talking about this. This is where you will find form. This is where it's sometimes called the formal cause. This is where you will find the structural, functional organization. Right. Conditions are structurally, functionally organized such that motion for this is possible. Now, this is important because this is, of course, actuality, and this is where we get potentiality. When I shape possibility, that's what I mean when I say something is potential. I mean that possibility has been shaped by constraints so that these events are more possible than these events. Okay, so we're going to do more, but let's stop here and let's see how this is already starting to solve the problem of talking about the tree and its self-organization. So in a tree, you've got a bunch of events happening, biochemical events. 
what they're doing is they're actually causing a particular right, form or formula or structural functional organization. Now think about it. Why do trees grow the way they do? Why do they grow like this? Why do they spread out their branches? Why do their leaves spread out? Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to change the possibility of a photon hitting a chlorophyll molecule. The structure of the tree shapes the possibility of the events. So the events, right, cause this structure and then, right, they cause it but this then constrains the events. So look at me, I'm a living thing. I've got a bunch of events happening in me and that creates a structural functional organization. That organization creates an internal environment in which the probability of events is dramatically altered. So events that have very low probability happening out there have a high probability of happening in here. And events that have a very high probability of happening out there have a very low probability of happening in here. And that's what it is to be a living thing. The events, right, cause a structure, a structural functional organization, an IDOS, a form, and then that constrains the events. Now this is not a circular explanation because I'm talking about two very different kinds of things. I'm talking about actuality and potentiality. Now, it's important to realize that the discussion of possibility, many of you were saying, oh, this is like, oh, it's so abstract, and what does this, this is actually integral to science. Okay? Science depends on there being real potential. The potentiality is a real thing, right? So, you know, here's the object moving around. All right, uh, it's on the ground. Look at all this kinetic energy. Look at it moving. Look at, oh, it stopped. Did I destroy all that energy? Where did the kinetic energy go? You can't destroy energy. Well, the kinetic energy has become potential energy. If the principle of the conservation of mass and energy is real, then potentiality is real. Look at this. Look at, look at something from Newton. Force equals mass times acceleration. Is that an event? Is it, oh, that's happening over there right now? Or is it, is it, th does it happen every Tuesday at 4 o'clock? This isn't an event. This is, right, how things are shaped. It puts a limit on what's possible in the world. Talking about real potentiality is not talking fictional or abstract. It's a, it's a way of talking that's integral to our current science. Okay. We're still not done though. Because Yararo points out that there are two kinds of constraints. So our explanations can become even more refined. There are constraints that make uh, a form of event, a type of event, more possible. She calls those enabling constraints. And then there are constraints that reduce the possibilities, reduce the options for a system. These are the selecting or selective constraints. Now this is going to give us a very powerful way of understanding uh, development. Let's use it the way Uraro does to talk about one of the most significant theories of development and change, one of the great hallmarks of science. In fact, this, it's a foundational theory for the science of biology, which of course is the theory of natural selection, the theory of Darwinian evolution. Because the theory of Darwinian evolution is probably the first dynamical systems theory in science, and it is a theory that is designed precisely to account for growth and development. Obviously not within an individual, but across speciation. Okay, so let's take a look at the theory. So what you're looking for, first of all, is there has to be a feedback cycle for, right, any dynamical system theory, because we're talking about a process that's self-organizing. So what's the feedback cycle that evolution talks about? Of course, well, it's sexual reproduction. Where do goats come from? Other goats. Goats are produced. 
There's the product, and then it feeds back into the system and becomes the producer. Makes more goats that make more goats that makes more goats. That's why we call it reproduction. It's a feedback cycle. So what did Darwin realize? Well, he realized that there were selective constraints operating on that. There were conditions in the environment that reduced the options for organism. That's right. So what's those conditions? Scarcity of resources. Okay. So um, I, 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 I've been looking at some of the theories of early life, and there's an argument by uh, several biologists that there's no evolution for about probably 800,000 years or so because there's no scarcity of resources when life first evolves. So life is static because there's no scarcity of resources. Scarcity of resources means there's competition. Scarcity of resources means not everything can live. And so that reduces the options for the system. Okay, so selection, reducing options. But that's not all that's going on, right? If that was the case, everything would just die. Evolution would end. And, you know, and that can happen, extinction events. But there's something else. There's enabling constraints that open up the system, open up the options. So look around. Look at me, look at other people. There's variation. There's considerable variation. Variation increases the options. So look what's going on here. You've got this feedback cycle. As it's, as it's cycling through, you've got the selective conditions reducing the options that are available and then the variation opening them up. And you can think of it almost like an accordion model. The variation opens it up, and then as it, as it cycles, the selective constraint pushes it down. And then from there, it opens up again, and then it gets pushed back down. And then it opens up again, and gets pushed back down. And as it cycles like this, it's constantly changing in a way to be better fitted to the environment. That's evolution. Right? It's a kind of circular. Evolve is related to words like revolve. It's this revolution with change. Now notice, what I'm trying to get you to see is like, first of all, this is important. I mean, I wish I was Charles Darwin. This is one of the great, great theories. He gets to sail around the world. I mean, what a life. He gets to sail around the world, go to some amazing places, and then he comes back and makes a world-changing theory. It's, just, it's amazing. But notice how much this Darwinian theory that is at the foundation of biology, how much it is beholden to Aristotle, how much it depends on Aristotelian ideas. Okay, now Uraro talks about this as a virtual governor. So a governor is, right, is any device that sort of limits what you can do um, on a system. Like if you have a governor on a steam engine, right, it sets the range, it, it limits the range at, at which it can cycle. She calls it a virtual governor because it's not an actual machine, it's the shaping of possibility. She stops there. And work that I've done with Leo Ferraro and Anderson Todd and Richard Wu, we think we should, you, she should continue to finish the metaphor. This is a virtual generator because it's a set of conditions that are generating options for a self-organizing system. And here's the idea. When you put a virtual governor systematically together with a virtual generator, such that you are systematically regulating a feedback cycle, This whole thing is a virtual engine, because when you attach a governor to a generator, you get a virtual engine. So this is what a dynamical system theory is. A dynamical system theory is basically a theory that lays out 
the virtual engine. It shows you how there's a feedback cycle and why that's not just random and chaotic, why it produces growth and development precisely because there's a systematic relationship between a set of enabling and selective constraints. Now, all of this is very, very Aristotelian. So let's now take it back to Aristotle. Because Aristotle was interested, now he, he doesn't use this, he doesn't use the dynamical systems language, that's our language. But this language was directly inspired by, powered by Aristotle. So using it backwards to try and connect Aristotle to our current understanding, I do not think is anachronistic. So Aristotle is interested in our development. He's going to add something that was missing from the Socratic notion of wisdom. Remember, the Socratic notion was trying to overcome self-deception. And then Plato adds a whole structural theory of the psyche to explain how we overcome self-deception, how we become wise and achieve wisdom. But what's missing in the account of wisdom and meaning, according to Aristotle, if I can use this language, is what's missing is an account of growth and development. How does wisdom develop? How does meaning develop? Well, this is where we get something that we talk about and we use as in our language, but we don't, I think, get the depth of what Aristotle's talking about. There's an aspect of who and what you are that's fundamentally connected to your projects of meaning and your project of wisdom. You often might have used this term or related terms, but do you really know what you're talking about? And this is the notion of your character. Now, first of all, your character isn't your personality, because if we're going to use these terms strictly, you're born with your personality. Personality is part of your, just your general constitution. It's what's given to you by the biology and the environment that you have no choice over. Right? But your character is that aspect of you that you can cultivate. Now, you can either cultivate it unconsciously, surreptitiously, indirectly, or you can cultivate it more explicitly. But what is your character? When we say that somebody's acting out of character, we're usually making, and this is important, we're usually making either an existential or moral criticism of them. When we say, Peter is acting out of character, we often will mean something like, he's normally honest. He's normally honest. He normally has the virtue of honest. Notice the connection here, by the way. Virtue. And we've been talking about a virtual engine. That is not happenstance. When you're talking about a virtue, you're not talking about an event. You're talking about, again, a set of conditions that have been cultivated systematically in somebody. Now that points to something, that when we're talking about character, I'm going to suggest that what we're talking about is what is the virtual engine on a person's development? What system of constraints have you identified with? And what system of constraints have you internalized that regulate your development? Let's, let's ask a Socratic question. Let's do something that Socrates would do. We spend a lot of time on our appearance. We spend a lot of time on our status. How much time did you spend today on your character? How much? If it is the virtual engine that is regulating your growth and development, you should be, of course, spending a lot of time on your character. But are you? Now, Aristotle proposed ways of trying to cultivate your character. I, I, I would argue that his method, his famous method of the golden mean, is a way of trying to get you to set up conditions to cultivate your character. So for example, what is courage? We would all like to be more courageous, I take it. Well, Aristotle proposed that it falls, it's the golden mean 
not the average, that's a misunderstanding, right, because it's golden mean, between two things. Of course, you can be a coward. You can somehow be defective by having a deficiency, but you can also be foolhardy. Right? Just running into traffic doesn't make you courageous. So what you're always trying to do is you're trying to set up a system where you're paying attention, where you lack the enabling constraints, where you don't have enough generation, and also conditions where you lack the selective constraints. When you have, you're, right, you're too broadly, you have too many options that you're identifying as courage. What you have to do is you have to train yourself. You have to cultivate your character by engaging in practices that will slowly, over time, create a virtual engine. Because you are, look, you are a self-organizing process. You are the source of your actions that modify the environment that then feeds back into you and changes you. And then you produce your actions and then the environment feeds back and changes you. Here's the question I ask you. Are you just letting that run? Or are you trying to rationally and reflectively cultivate your character, structure a virtual engine so that that self-organizing process is growing and developing in an optimal fashion? Aristotle takes the question, and we, 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 we use this, we even use, and we, I'm not saying we, we use it trivially, but we don't get the depth of what, we say, what we're saying. One of the most trenchant criticisms we can make of ourselves, of other people, is this. Listen, listen to my language. Listen to it. He's not living up, living up to his potential. Part of what makes your life meaningful is that you have cultivated character that allows you to actualize your potential. You've created a virtual engine that regulates your development in a way in which you grow up. It's a constantly in it's a con it's a in which self-organization has been regulated and shaped into self-improvement so that your potential is fully realized. So Aristotle brings in this notion then of development and growth as part of what it means to have a meaningful life. He brings in a new aspect to the notion of wisdom. Wisdom is gaining the ability to cultivate virtues, to create your virtual engine, a set of right, virtues a, 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 that basically is regulating your growth and development so that you actualize your potential. Again, think about it. What are you doing to cultivate your character? Because Aristotle points out there's a deep form of foolishness that comes from a lack of character. He calls it acrasia, which we poorly translate as weakness of the will because we're all post-Protestants and we think the will is our central thing, even though increasingly there's scientific evidence that the notion of will or willpower is a defunct idea. We should give it up. Right? So what's acrasia? Acrasia is when you know what the right thing to do is. You know what the right thing to do is. And we talked about this, remember, with the chocolate cake. But you don't do the right thing. And here's where we can sort of put Aristotle and Plato together. Plato gives us this sort of story about how we have to structure the psyche. But Aristotle gives us a much more penetrating analysis of what that structural functional organization is. Here's what Aristotle would say, why you're behaving foolishly. Ignorance is when you do the wrong thing because you don't know. Part of what foolishness is, is when you know what the right thing is and you still do the wrong thing. Here's Aristotle's answer. You do the wrong thing because although you have the right beliefs, and notice the, again, the impotence of belief here, you don't have the right, you don't have sufficient character. 
You have not trained things. You've not trained skills. You've not trained sensitivities. You have not created a virtual engine that is regulating your development and growth such that you will live up to your potential. You will actualize yourself and do the right thing. So, we're starting to see, again, the deep grammar of what we talk about when we talk about meaning. And we notice now that there's this developmental aspect to it. What is it to live up to your potential? I mean, that's a phrase we use. What is it you're saying when you say that about somebody? Why does it matter so much? So Aristotle would say, let's go back to the analogy. Please always remember that it's an analogy. Let's go back to the analogy of a man-made thing. Okay? How, would, how is it when we know when something has been well made? What makes a, a, something a good knife? Right? Well, when it has a structural functional organization, right, that allows it to fulfill its purpose. So knives are for cutting. If I've taken the potential in the metal and organized it the right way, structured it the right way, it will actually function to cut very well. Right? And notice that this is a word that's also deeply associated with our sense of what it is to have meaning. So, Aristotle asks, well, what can we do with this analogy? Human beings aren't made the way knives are made. We're self-making. And here's, here's an important idea. We're self-making. We're not just self-organizing. The term that Francisco Varela and Evan Thompson have generated to talk about this is we are autopoetic. We are self-making things. So you're different from a tornado. A tornado is self-organizing, but a tornado will m move its behavior. It can be rapidly self-destructive. It will move into conditions that destroy it. You're self-organized in such a way that you have a structural functional organization that allows you to seek out conditions. So the tornado does not seek out the conditions that will protect and promote its own self-organization. It's not self-making. You are self-making. So here's the interesting thing, it, and this is a brilliant idea that Eric Pearl bring, brings out in his book, Thinking Being, right? In living things, right, the purpose of the thing is its structural functional organization. It's a, it's a self-making thing. So what your, what your purpose, your function is, is to enhance your structural functional organization. It's like, oh, wow, well, that's... This is a problem, you'll say, with philosophy. This is also abstract. What does that mean specifically? Well, for Aristotle, it means paying attention to the fact that you are a rational, reflective creature. You're unlike a plant. A plant has this, but all it basically does is actualize its ability to sort of digest. So let's take a look at this. We have inorganic matter, right? And then it gets a particular, it's informed, and that makes like a living thing. And that living things can get a more complex structure that make them self moving. That's what an animal is. An animal isn't a mammal. An animal is a self-moving thing. And then some of those self-moving things have structural functional organizations, here's in here, for example, that take that self-moving and really actualize it. Remember we talked about that the word psyche, 
where we get our word psychology, mind, originally meant your capacity for self-moving. And we came to apply it to the mind because the mind is that part of you that is the sel most self-moving, the most self-making. You're a mental thing, a psychological thing. But is that enough? No, we're getting from Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, you can optimize that. You can take charge of that. You, unlike other organisms, you can do the actual revolution on yourself. You're capable of cultivating your own character rationally and deliberately. You can become, right, a rational thing. To live up to your potential is to make sure you have cultivated a character that takes you as high up this hierarchy as you can go. That's how you live up to your potential. Somebody who lived only as a plant would be a debauched, failed, degraded human being. Somebody that lived only as an animal, unreflectively, impulsively, would be a debauched, failed human being. But the argument continues. You say, of course, of course. But all the way up here, you must cultivate your character so that you, as much as possible, actualize your potential for being a rational, moral human being. That's the hallmark of, for Aristotle. You become a good person if you actualize, if you inform your being with a virtual engine that really realizes those things that are distinctive of our humanity. What makes us different from the plants, the animals, the other creatures that just have minds? What makes us different? We understand that we have always, and we still do understand ourselves in contrast to the other things we find around ourselves. How are, why am I more valuable than this table? Why does it, why do I matter more? Because there are things that can be found in rational beings things that we find intrinsically valuable and important that cannot be found in, mere, in merely mental things, and all the way down. What are those characteristics that are unique to us? Well, here's where Aristotle gives the axial revolution answer. Your capacity for overcoming self-deception, your capacity for cultivating your character, for realizing wisdom and for enhancing the structure of your psyche and your contact with reality. That's what rational means. This sounds, if I hadn't said all this, what I'm going to say now would sound trite. Your purpose is to become as fully human as possible. How are you cultivating your character to do so? This is what Aristotle is going to ask you again and again. How much of your life is dedicated to creating a virtual engine that realizes your rational capacities, those things that make you most human in contrast to all the other things around you? So, Aristotle has developed this very impressive theory of wisdom, and character, growth and development. 
One of the things we could use today is to go back and make use of this so we can reanimate, rejuvenate these terms that have become tr tired and superficial. We have no alternative terms to, for describing our lives for the meaning in our life. We talk about purpose and living up to our potential and growth and development and which blah, 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 because we don't have any depth to these terms. One of the things we can use Aristotle to do is to go back and deepen what those terms mean for us, rejuvenate what they mean for us. But I want to continue on and to talk about this development that was occurring in the Axial Revolution. And I want to talk about how Aristotle helped further the historical process by which he contributed to our cultural grammar of what it is when we're talking about meaning, purpose, wisdom, self-transcendence. And so what I want to look at next time when we're together is I want to look at Aristotle's account of a worldview and what a worldview is and why it matters so deeply to our self-understanding and our existential meaning. Thank you very much for your time. All right, guys, uh, thanks for watching. We're going to take, I think, a 14 minute break or so, and then we'll be back uh, with the discussion. So we're going to leave the link in, I think, Patreon first and um, then or do we, we care? Just, why don't we just leave the link now and then people can join and we'll just admit people. Yeah, in sure, the order. sure, sure, sure. OK, yeah. so um, I'll leave the link in the chat. You guys can click that to join. Um, I won't admit everyone until right before the discussion. So just make sure you're you know, ready to go. Join the waiting list now. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. See you in a bit. And uh, the link is, uh, you will see it in the chat, but it's, what is it, futurethinkers.org slash discuss? Is that what we're using? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. Cool. See you in a see bit. See you guys shortly.
Hey guys, so we're going to get the discussion going in about two minutes. Um, if you want to join, please do by going to futurethinkers.org slash discuss. All right, now just let me set this up. No audio. Uh, you're muted, Mike. Hey, there hey. we go. <laughs> okay. One, two, three, four, five. How's everyone doing? Good. Let me make sure Great. there's no issues here. Can everybody in the chat hear us fine? Yeah, I think we're good. Cool. Cool. All right. So that yeah. was one of my favorite ones. Yeah, so me far. too. Uh, I love that he talks about how humans uh, are and living things are by nature participating in circular causality that they're self-making. And the more self-making they become, that basically is the direction of evolution is, is for living things to become more self-making, <laughs> which in the case of humans is the ability to consciously direct our own evolution. He didn't say it in exactly those terms, but that's that's the essence of it. And I, and I absolutely love that point about this lecture. Sounds like Yuvi's mic isn't working out. Oh, my mic isn't working. Awesome. So many issues today. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Can you guys hear me at all? Yeah. Just yeah. Okay, how about now? Yeah, okay. You. you know what? I, I've got a whole bunch of, like, every time I get an update, on this thing, it screws up my audio. So you guys will hear just my microphone. Chat, I think, will properly hear both of us. So just speak loudly because it's <laughs> going to oh. be quite a quite a bit. To fix that. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like we can hear UV pretty pretty well. I just uh, just heard a little bit more of the background echo. So yeah. That's how I could tell. Oh. Yeah. But it's it wasn't it wasn't a problem to hear. So thoughts, mm. Heather, David. Cody, Stephanie. Heather, you're muted. Somehow you're not coming through. <laughs> <laughs> Technology. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> um. Hey, Cody. Um, are you? Uh, you're. You're not muted yet. You have some background noise. So, um, if you'd. Oh, when sorry. You're yeah, no problem. No problem. I just want to make sure if you want to comment, you know, if you want to mute, but otherwise. Those sunglasses. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I am also, um, again, 
just blown away by the breadth that Verveke covers in a single lecture and that there are 50 of these things. It's just like mind boggling how much, how much of what he covers alters the way that I think about the way that I think, you know, even having seen these, I mean, this is the second time going through and watching this. Um, the fact that actual comes from act, virtual comes from virtue, that these are parts of feedback loops that talk about us realizing our potential. Um, the, you know, just, just the things that are, that are kind of blowing me away right now, having spent time thinking about this and talking about some previous calls, the circular versus linear nature and the feedback loop provides a dynamic interaction between those. Um, and as, um, as somebody commented, uh, Mr. Manifold commented that it looks like something in human development, the ability, I've, I've been looking a little bit more at feedback loops as well, thinking about the fact that we have, um, we developed a capacity to have extra space for developing, developing focused thinking, right? So we developed, um, through agriculture and other tools, the ability to sort of um, push nature away from us far enough that we could develop a linear focus. You know, we could we could kind of say the constraints are reduced in, in some real way and kind of maintain a forward trajectory long enough to develop things like language and numbers and you know science and all of that. Um, and now we're coming back to a point where it's like, okay, nature's now starting to come back into the picture as we're pushing up against those constraints in a way that causes us to have to back up. It's, it's fascinating too, the whole kind of thesis of this series is the meaning crisis. Seem, seem to me, I mean, this is intuitional that he doesn't actually say this, but the meaning crisis occurs at the point at which our ability to fulfill our potential is meeting the constraints of our, you know, that, that somehow, I'm not sure if this is right or not. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's such, such a strange thing to think about how meaning occurs for human beings and whether meaning occurs for other species in some way, or if meaning really is an invention that happens with this ability to push nature away for a little while and actually have an ability to have cognition sufficiently complex to think of a purpose, think of a, a meaning to life, um, to, to, to create an abstraction of purpose, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's like, it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of meta feedback loop, right? This very um, amplified version of development that allows us to um, hone our hone the way that we develop through culture. So anyway, yeah, blown away just because there's so much there. Um, it's almost difficult for me to kind of back up and wrap my mind around everything that he covered. There was another point that he made about uh, how those constraints uh, are actually a major function in evolution. And if they weren't there, then evolution wouldn't happen. And that biologists even talk about a, a very long period in, in history of living things that there was not very much evolution because there was such abundance, there were no constraints on resources. And so I've been thinking about this quite a lot as, as we seem to be going through this crisis, not just the crisis of meaning, but many different crises in the world. Um, and, and to zoom out and to think about it from a kind of a, a big picture perspective. And I wonder if it's in a way humans creating our own constraints on this very large scale, like humans and nature kind of playing together to create these constraints so that we can evolve to the next stage. I, I think it's, I don't know, my intuition about that is that it's not so conscious. It's like we push our limits to the point where those constraints, like we push up to our limits, you know, 
those constraints don't manifest until we're like using all the planet's resources and then suddenly we have to do something and now we're forced to evolve. It's not like we've had plenty of time to, to do something differently, evolve kind of preemptively before those constraints. But yeah, I mean, that's not a, that's not a good strategy if you think about it. <laughs> There, there tends to be like I, I've noticed since I was having a conversation with a friend about about stubbornness of humans, this this kind of stubborn nature, and I, and I didn't want it to be. I thought it was just like oh, like my my lineage is like, you know, like my dad was stubborn, my grandfather was stubborn. And I'm like no, no, no. I think humans are stubborn. We 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 don't. We're unwilling to do certain things, and I love that word. You know, like we're not willing. We're not using our will to do certain things, um, and and even with that stubbornness we're sometimes um we're we're unwilling to to grow you know we're we're actually not using our will and as soon as we do use our will things start happening so i i'm really i you know speak to your point of like yeah we we, we got to this point because we were so stubborn we didn't want to give up um you know the power that we have you know using oil and, and you know and gas we, we all these things that actually come from our humans stubborn nature and then we get to this point where we now we have to use our our willpower um to get out of the situations that we get in and it's almost like this game we want to play with ourselves we're like let's let's get ourselves in the stickiest situation ever and let's see if we can get out and we can we always can we have the greatest we have like the greatest invention that's ever been made in history the human mind and like the and the ability to connect with other human minds, create the most awesome network, and make the most brilliant things. But for some reason, we want to prove to ourselves that like it's it's really awesome by just, I mean, the worst situations ever, and that we're finding ourselves in it now. And it's like, great, let's see if we can get out. And it's like, well, yeah, we fucking can. We're gonna hop on calls like this and talk to people and connect. And it's and, it's, and now it's fun. You know, we're actually enjoying <laughs> this part where it forces us to connect. You know, and it's like cool. This is actually what we really love. But why do we have to do that part? Why do we have to go through the shit first? I don't know. I, it's something about it. Can um, you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we can. Okay, uh, awesome. Cody, just a little note. Um, you're. It sounds like you got maybe a loose connection or something on the. We could hear everything you were saying, but there's a lot of noise as you were talking. Yeah, I'm. I might. I'm, I'm in a car and I have to get a haircut in like a couple minutes, so I'm just okay. like wanted to hop on this call. So okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us. I think your question was really good. Why do we have to go through that part uh, and put ourselves through that? But I think it co comes back to that the constraints are part of the the equation. So you need the constraints along with what was the other part? There's two. The constraints select selection was that the no? The it was uh, the enabling constraints and the enabling se selective constraints. constraints. Yeah. And selective constraints. Okay, so I guess we need both. I'm thinking of I think though the selective constraints, which yeah. are the tough ones, and then I think of how those trickle down to a micro level, and in my own life, personal evolution along these lines has come out of those kind of constraints. Um, but yeah, they suck uh, when you're on the ground in them. But but aren't they so much fun? Aren't we enjoying it? You know, the kind of like weird <laughs> spiritual growth? Like even, even, even being like a creative person, anytime you create, like I'm a musician. So if I had like a room full of all the instruments in the world, I had synthesizers, guitars, mics, and I had all the things, it's almost too much. But if I constrain myself, I give myself like, a drum set and a guitar then i can actually start making things and you get to you get to make cool stuff with the constraints that are like necessary everything else is too much it's almost overwhelming there's a there's a quotation creativity loves limits i have no idea who said that but i use it all the time it's so key you're absolutely right yeah it's yeah. funny i've i've started doing like a paper notation for my goals and stuff so it's like i've got a page and i throw sticky notes on it and my constraint now has become like how many sticky notes can i fit on, fit on that page it turns out it's only it's only eight so i can only be working on eight things simultaneously <laughs> and that sounds still like a lot but i like flitting from all of them but it's like amazing how much more is getting done now that i have this limitation just from a physical page because before that, we had this gigantic, Trello. well, we had Trello, which was a mess. And then we also tried this 
creating this gigantic sheet of paper that had like rows upon rows of sticky notes of all the different things and it was too much yeah <laughs> so I, there's there's a go ahead David. there's another as, there's another aspect here i wanted to kind of go back to your point mike about the fact that i mean it, it, it ties it ties in with all of this um your point that you're not sure how conscious it is um I've been so I, I love the perspective that we have a musician and artist on the call. There's something that happens at that level that you know that it's not purely conscious. The act of creation isn't willing the the art to come through. It's somehow allowing the art to come through. And um, and I was noticing uh, there's an, a recent interview with. Um, uh, Kas Kasparov, where he's talking about the fact that um, it's a very bizarre thing to be playing chess at the level he was playing, because there's an intuition. He doesn't know what the actual right move is. He's feeling into it. There's a, a feeling tone of listening to it, but it's not a clear answer. Yes, I know. It's, it feels like I know, but it's like no it's just like in this direction and then continuing that direction and like it unfolds it sort of um informs <laughs> so it, this, this another word choice you know the in formation this, this kind of the shape of the game brings forth the the intelligence of the feedback loop in process that's just um it, it is a so it's something like it's not at the level of consciousness that we think oh we have a recipe for it i can just go through and you know logically run through it um but it but it is something that's happening that i can feel into the space of what wants to happen yeah i think it would be a mistake to say that something is conscious or not conscious and if it's not conscious therefore it's not intelligent and i i know that it's a bit of a semantics like we're trying to figure out what words to use but the unconscious has so much wisdom, even if we're just talking about human unconscious, it's infinitely more wise than the conscious rational mind. And I think the same goes for nature, but even broader because nature is, you know, 4 billion years old on this planet. So whatever kind of processes are happening there, I don't think they're random, you know? So there is some sort of a wisdom and a, and an organization to it. We just, we look at it and we think it's not conscious, but, Maybe it is, just not on the same level of consciousness that we think of as conscious, if that makes sense. I was thinking about this actually this morning with um, linking pro like propositional knowing, which obviously is a very conscious experience, and participatory knowing as being sort of the very deepest level of subconscious knowledge. And thinking back to participatory knowing as sort of the method by which a shaman picks up on complex patterns, that that that's that very much sounds like sitting in front of a chessboard at that level and being able to just know where the pieces go because you're in you're you are the chessboard in that situation. You you've you've had some kind of communion with the chessboard because you know it that well. Participatory knowing. I, I, I haven't, I, you know, I heard that I heard him say that a million times, but those two words right there have that sense of I'm participating, but knowing doesn't seem like I'm acting. Knowing almost feels like I'm receiving. So I'm participating and receiving at the same time. And now we're playing in that, like the, uh, the, the emerging field where I'm witnessing emergence, you know, I'm witnessing unfolding. Um, I, I, I'm active, but I'm, I'm letting go, you know, I'm actively letting go. Like all of that is so paradoxical and so beautiful. Um, I do have to run and get this haircut. So I'll talk to you guys next conversation. Okay. Thanks so much for this. <laughs> all right. See you, Cody. <laughs> Bye. I like that distinction actually, that, that it's not you, uh, creating the knowing it's you participating in the knowing or, or receiving something as well. It also kind of depends on where where you think this you is located. If you identify as your sort of rational um, 
conscious mind, then yeah, you could say it's not me I'm receiving. But if, if you also include the unconscious and all of that stuff, then it's, well, it's kind of harder to say if you're receiving or generating it on some level. I think it's probably both. It, that's, I think that's true. And, um, you know, my, in listening to this, I kind of expanded out another layer as well. Um, as you know, I, I made the comment in the thread as I was watching the, the watching the lecture that there's something in me that when he talks about not living up to my potential as a human being, that makes me feel inferior because I'm, there there are a lot of people who would say what I'm doing right now isn't living up to my potential, and and I see what I'm doing is I'm living up to our potential in a way that most people don't even know is possible. What Vervek is pointing to, and I think what we're talking about with game B is there is a new potential of human being that we don't even know is possible that we're starting to listen into that I'm attuning to. And it's frustrating at times and at the same time, exciting at times, just as Cody mentioned, to feel into how much more potential we have to, to address this. So it's something like, it's not only individual potential that we're living into. It is, it is the species potential. It's like, oh, there's a, there is a new awareness of some direction that, um, that this game B is starting to be an interesting um, attractor for bringing the people together, which is amazing because you know, so many of the people that I hear who are participating in these discussions say, I've been thinking about this for so long and I've been looking for other people that's finally wonderful to run into other people who are thinking this way. And I feel the same way. It's like, where, where were you? Where was everybody? 15 years ago. And in some sense, we didn't have the seed to start the conversation. You know, we were, we were having these thoughts independently and kind of, and I remember having those thoughts and thinking, I can't quite form them. I can't communicate them well enough to somebody else. I can, I can notice every once in a while, I'll say something that seems to tickle some of the same points, but it wasn't until I get back to Verveke that it's like, wow, he puts it all in context. Um, in a way that allows me to back up and see the connections between the pieces. I really think that, to a large extent, Verveke's lecture series is a large reason that some of the conversations that um, Schmachtberger and, and Jordan Hall are, are starting to come around and become, you know, um, this isn't completely the case. Obviously, the, um, you guys have been doing this for a while, and so have you know, Daniel Thorsten at Emerge and, and the Rebel Wisdom guys. But there's something that feels like it's much more vibrant and um, interconnected the pieces feel really feel like they're starting to swirl together in, in a new way yeah it's hard to tell where the rest of the zeitgeist is at right now like I've, i just flipped open episode six and it's only eighteen thousand views i mean that's a, that's enough for a lot of people to be dis discussing it in in concentrated forms online but it's really not that much on the global scale so there's this right. like early movement of people touching into and experiencing collective intelligences and, and we spaces and, and doing this because they're both internally driven to do it, but also recognize that there's a big need to, to participate in this way. Um, and yet we're so far away from it. But I, I think what's what, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, there's just one more thing to that. There, there's the record. There's a lack of recognition, like you were just saying, not feeling like, by an external measure, not you're not living up to your potential, but knowing what's happening on on the inside and recognizing the necessity for that. So it's kind of like, you know, when society looks at the early adopter and says you're crazy for even thinking that 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 thing is going to work, but you know the early adopter recognizes the necessity and, and the inevitability of the thing they're doing. And yeah, I, I just think that's a, an important thing that that more and more people are recognizing that. It's not going to be some special global dictator or some new piece of software or, you know, something that that brings us into game B or some new post capitalist civilization. It's going to be groups of people doing exactly what we've been doing. These these types of like collective intelligence discussions. There's another thing that I've been thinking about um, in, in regards to uh, masculine transformation and feminine transformation in a very archetypal sense. So masculine transformation is often uh, like a, hero, a hero's journey, basically. So a hero who's kind of reluctant at first goes out into the unknown, points his will, 
uh, fights some sort of a, a monster, gains knowledge, and then brings it back to the tribe and, and shares it with the tribe. So it's, uh, it starts with very kind of outward, active pointing of will. And then in the end, there is a moment of surrender. And the feminine transformation is almost flipped. It's the opposite. It's a going within, it's a letting go, it's an allowing, it's very passive at first. It's like move, l allowing something to move through you. Like archetypally, basically it's like pregnancy and birth is a feminine transformation. So it's like you are not doing it, nature is doing it to you. And, but then at the end, there's a, a the, that action, that outward action is the result. So whereas in the masculine transformation, outward action is what starts it, and then there's a surrender. Feminine transformation is surrender, and then there's an outward action at the end. So th this transformation that a lot of people seem to be going through, and with all this collective intelligence and kind of we spaces and whatever, it feels a lot more feminine to me, because a lot of it is kind of more about like listening to the group, like listening in and surrendering and allowing and creating this space that is going to be conducive to life out of which things can then emerge. I, I'm not sure I disagree or that I agree with that just in the sense that the mature masculine isn't so obnoxious, but still very necessary in these types of groups. It's not going to be so noticeable that hard pointed will, but it exists. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's for these groups to work. It, it requires it. A more mature masculine not just sort of kind of a blanketed feminine way of doing yeah it's both perspectives i'm not saying that it's all feminine i'm saying that the transformation itself has a more flavor of feminine transformation not necessarily on an individual level or i'm saying that we need women leaders i'm saying that the process itself mimics the feminine transformation more so than the hero's journey right about the process not the manifestation right well, I would just wonder if that's if that's the truth or, or your perspective and if there's examples that we haven't discussed mm -hmm. of, of how it would resemble a, the masculine transformation as well. I mean, that's aside from it, the point. It, well, I think it's I think it's actually a good uh, it's a good contemplation. It's hard to know exactly. I mean, I, I, one thing that I'm I'm increasingly aware of is that trying to discern what the actual map is that realistically reflects the world is fool foolhardy it just doesn't it doesn't make any sense it continues in waves and layers and there's something about noticing that the full cycle includes both a masculine a, a yin and yang um, um, aspect to it um, and that even from the like yin and yang expressed in a more constrained environment is going to look different than it does in an abundant environment. Um, there, the, the, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to, at this point, even avoid the, the notion of healthy and unhealthy masculine and feminine mm. and just look at it as constrained and abundant. Um, and there's something, there's something like, um, noticing in, in this moment, kind of, um, feeling into where the culture wants to go from this point. Um, the the notion of the um, Polynesian navigators comes to mind, and this is a this is something that if you're not aware of it, is the the notion of the Polynesian navigators. The the um, it's actually kind of interesting because um, with the Disney movie uh, Moana recently, um, it's a woman who's you know it's a female who's actually going out and exploring, um, but I think traditionally it's been men. I don't know if that's true or not, but the, but the but the navigation aspect is feeling into the environment, it's sort of peering into the ocean and the and the sky and looking out there and perceiving where the next island is. It's a it's 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 a very interesting combination of deep receptivity and deep forecasting of what, you know, a, a point, a focused, uh, you know, it's uh, it's actually the thing that I think is kind of interesting in this um, exploration is in these moments where we're kind of in transition, the concerted, um, the way that uh, yin and yang work together um, seems much more dynamic and the cycle seems to be more quick between them. The, the ability to 
allow and then switch to focus and the switch to allowing this diffuse and focused thinking back and forth determine you know, depending on what the circumstances demand um, the ability to do that more readily almost simultaneously gives a kind of um, an ability for us to grasp this current moment and it's almost essential for us to be able to do that in order to be able to navigate this very uncertain terrain that we're in i love the way you put that yeah, the focus and allowing is very much, I mean, how do I say that? I just love the 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 archetypal influence of the masculine and feminine on those two. And I love how you've said they need, they need to be operating together to have any kind of functional understanding about the universe. I love that UV brought up the feminine archetype in this to begin with because I wasn't even aware of that model. So if you think of the level of hero's journey that we've been exposed to culturally, and then you try and move into this space without even an, uh, without even a basic map for the feminine version of that, which is what I've been doing, it's very uh, hard to understand what's happening but as soon as I can see it in those terms, that matches exactly my experience. And it suddenly uh, doesn't seem so strange because it doesn't match the hero's journey. It matches something else. And it's matching what Evie's talking about. And I think, David, you're exactly right. The, the, the thing that it's, it's uh, moving towards, I think, in anyone who's uh, working on this kind of, of stuff within themselves is this uh, simultaneity of experience uh, from the perspective of both so that the the receiving is informing the going forth and the going forth is informing the receiving in this constant process that just unfolds. Um, so thank you both. That was helpful. <laughs> I love what Stephanie contributed in the chat as well, um, that the possibility that the focus is allowing us to focus on the conditions um, instead of the actions. So there's, there is an, it's like, um, it's like, again, a second tier kind of um, focused or diffuse thinking, um, which does it, you know, that the, the more that I contemplate what it is that Verveke is uh, pointing out and what's happening with game B, it is this, this moment. And it, and it's, it's interesting too, because it's, um, I noticed that the degree of attention that it takes for me to stay with all of this is, um, is taxing in a new way. Um, I'm, I'm going through cycles of, um, of, um, you know, they, they, mimic kind of um, uh, manic depressive episodes. You know, there are states of elation and states of depression. And, and the depression states are more like, okay, there's, I don't see anything for me to do here. And it, it feels like the wind's out of my sails and like I just have to pause and wait for the next thing that grabs my attention to come forward. And it's like, am I avoiding something? Should I, should I force something to happen? Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, I'm not, it's not unfamiliar. It is uncomfortable. And, you know, as I'm, and it, and it tends to resolve itself more quickly and in an unexpected way as well. Um, just staying attuned to that, not needing to resolve it, but just being aware that, okay, just in this moment, stay, you know, diffuse focus, diffuse awareness to the moment that's happening. Uh, what's the next thing that's going to that's going to come forward? There's there's um there's something to uh, you know I I noted in this it's kind of interesting that the notion of the feedback loop and governing um, Norbert Wiener coined the term cybernetics specifically for that purpose. Um, gov cyber means governor um, essentially in Greek, and so it's a he was looking at the feedback loops and. He was one of the early computer scientists who was looking at um, artificial intelligence and how do we invoke 
feedback loops within machines to give them a, a more of a sense of self-guidedness. Um, and um, Claude Shannon was looking at the information theory, which is a very different format. And, and artificial intelligence has moved the direction of more the Claude Shannon uh, way for a while. And just recently with, with deep learning and some of the other recent techniques of machine learning, there's been much more of a feedback loop um, cybernetic influence. Um, but it's also, you know, this, this notion of the culture. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of floored with the scope that we're looking at these changes. Um, and one of the things I, I think about in particular is the notion of um, actually establishing a colony on Mars um, and thinking about and the way that our environment informs our evolution, that has just a potential for vastly shaping. I mean, I don't, I don't, it's like, I can't even conceive, but that notion that we could evolve, evolve in another completely different environment with different kinds of constraints, what that would do to us over time um, is, is, um, is kind of mind boggling. Um, and now I'll tie in one other thing here, which is, the, the the feminine masculine um, aspect, the yin yang aspect, um, also has um, it, it ties in with this, and I think more um, in terms of the the parts of a cell. If I think of the cell membrane and the DNA, the DNA is the informational component. It's not actually the inf the DNA isn't driving the behavior of the cell. It's the library of possible algorithms that the cell can en enact. But it's the membrane that's interacting with the environment that's saying, what are the conditions? What are the needs? What do we need to la let pass through the membrane in order for it to say, yes, this we need this. No, we don't need that. And it is, in a sense, resonating with looking up what's in the what's in the DNA, looking at the library functions of, OK, what is what are the possible ways that we can meet the current condition? Um, and it's a, in a, a beautiful dance between that um, allowing and that um, directing kind of a um, uh, intelligence. Hmm. Oh, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, Stephanie, I see you don't have a microphone and you've been typing in the Zoom chat. So actually the people who are following the live stream can't see what you're typing. So if you type it into the YouTube chat, it, I think it'll be better because then people will know what you're saying. So if you just want to copy and paste that in the YouTube chat, that'd be awesome. One thing that, that struck me actually earlier, if we don't mind going back a little bit to when we were talking about the, uh, the 18,000 views on the Verveki video and people starting to find each other. And um, what strikes me is the, the fact that the nature of the material um, makes me think that there are certain kinds of people that are focused on the things we're talking about right now. And that 18,000 people with a focus in that, in that direction are qualitatively different than say 18,000 people watching a video on how to set up the iPhone 6. Like it's a, it's a different level of, um, level's the wrong word. It's a, it's a different configuration of capacity and wisdom. There's, there's something people are able to access because of what, what, the videos are about what Verveki's talking about, what the Gandhi stuff is. People are are accessing this wisdom, right? That Verveki is is talking about, and so there is a lot more power in that eighteen thousand mm -hmm. than there otherwise be, would be, and I think more people are more easily able to find each other now and connect with each other as they as they deepen their their um, understanding of the things Verveke's talking about. 
I have to think about, I mean, how many of that is repeat watch and then how many people out there would be also on, on the other side of it, how many people would be totally into this and capable of, of grasping it and maybe quite advanced in their development, but wouldn't have yet been exposed to it. Um, I mean, it's, it's a relatively new series. It's only the beginning of this year. I think it just indicates at some level Yeah, let me come back to this. Actually, I, I, um, I want to kind of pick up on that that because I think that there is, I think I think you're right, Heather. I think that um, qualitatively, the people who are attracted to watching the series, especially as it kind of continues on, um, it's clear that there's a series. It 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 the series are the each lecture is enough standalone that some people might come in, but I doubt there are very many people i doubt the i imagine the majority of views are people who are watching the series um at the layer level i don't think they're coming in watching individual sessions and i i'd, I'd be curious about that but there's something in the um early phases of this so one of the things that i was surprised about and one of the reasons i i wanted to suggest these watch parties is because there's something that's just beyond the capacity um, or stretches the capacity of most people to really grok what this is all about. Um, that uh, several several very intelligent friends of mine who I've, I've recommended the series to and say, check this out, this is really profound, it's deep, and here's kind of the basis of it, would watch it and say, I don't quite get it. I don't know quite what he's talking about. You know, and, and talking through it a few times, it was like, okay, eventually they do kind of catch on. But it is... Um, it, it's some it's somehow different it's like it is not the same kind of listening that i would normally do where i'm actually acquiring information it's actually shifting the frame with which i use to think about things it's it's shifting my the structure of my thinking in such a way that new thoughts are coming in that the new a, a new basis for understanding this is is coming through um, and I think that it's very fairly early. And, and the fact that, given that, that the that he's got twelve thousand followers and um, you know eighteen thousand views for some of these is like that's actually pretty astounding um, to me. Um, and I think that the fact that they're recorded uh, and that we're doing this is going to continue to broaden that. You know, it's kind of slowly going out. And I'm actually glad that it's kind of slowly adopting. Um, one of the things that that I notice in some of the Facebook discussion groups is the speed with which people try to figure out, okay, what exactly is game B? What, how do we come up with kind of a algorithmic or, or um, formula, um, a recipe for success in that? Like, yeah, that's not, we're not gonna get there that way. This is really a, a much deeper kind of um, reflective allowing ha to happen rather than institute a solution and, and punch the go button. Um. which kind of yeah it, it relates to what i was trying to articulate and sometimes when we use words like feminine and masculine it it can create a response that well basically the, the response that mike had where um it you know you you responded to it as if i was talking about men and women but actually i was talking about more about yin and yang like archetypally, these are different processes. Mm. So uh, this kind of listening in and watching what emerges and kind of participating in something bigger than ourselves rather than consciously cr trying to create a structure or a goal and then trying to execute on that goal. Right. Yeah. 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 In, in context of what David was saying, like the type of listening necessary, it makes a lot more sense mm -hmm. what you were saying. And I totally see it i mean i was I even totally thinking of like the the necessity of of like that that point you were talking about where you're looking for how this applies or looking for something and then having that wave of elation and depression it's like it's almost like the masculine tendency to like want to grab the thing want to have the lesson it's like and it's almost like you're you were describing the the oscillation between the masculine and feminine ways of listening I which is causing too. you that depression yeah 
and sometimes, yeah, sometimes when we are kind of in this more receptive mode, um, from the outside, it looks like nothing is happening. And what you were saying, David, like from the outside, it can look like, oh, I'm not living up to society's expectations because you're not doing something, constructing something, like yeah. making plans, you know, doing that kind of, uh, again, we want to say masculine way of manifesting things in the world, but something is happening. You, you are transforming internally and going through a process and participating in something and tuning into something. Um, it just might be a bit more difficult to articulate, but it's not nothing. Go ahead. Heather. I think that describes exactly what John Verveke's lectures ask of the person watching them. And my experience is that when I'm watching the lectures, I don't feel like I'm getting a lot of what he's saying, but I'm taking it all in. And as I watch the next lecture or discuss it with someone or it bounces off some other idea in my life over the next few days or weeks, uh, it begins to come together into a very uh, solid new picture. And it doesn't seem like when I'm watching the lecture, a lot is happening. And yet over time, something new is emerging from what he's presenting. Um, so that, that I think is, is really uh, key, that feminine listening. Mm -hmm. as, as I find myself struggling as well with it, like oscillating in between those listening styles and also i'm i'm also struggling because i'm dealing with the technical side of streaming this thing so it's it's quite hard and i'm paying attention to the chat so uh, this time around i'm getting much less out of it than the first time because of that style and I'm, i've decided i think i'm going to watch this separately uh just to give it my full attention but when i was first listening to it jumping in and out of that i was i was finding myself um not getting it from the masculine perspective and then totally getting it from the feminine listen i would say listening style um and but i recognize how useful that is to the masculine and then how useful synthesizing and acting on that language is to the feminine you know like how these two styles really work together and and how necessary it is to just sit there and do nothing and not make to-do lists out of this and just listen is receptively as possible and let it marinate for for maybe even weeks before you start deciding what to do and i also think it's quite interesting how he how intuition or or some sort of thing pops up like some knowledge from the environment pops up and then you know exactly what it is that you need to do with this information and it's i, I can't even say that that's even still part of the masculine process because it's it's not like you own any of that or that you did any of that or, or pushed your will into it. It's just like it, uh, it was a sudden flash of inspiration and now I just know how materially to act on it. Um, and I can't tell you how many times in my life in the last two or so years that that style of oscillation between the two has worked and, and happened more frequently and then resulted in some like massive ch positive change in my life. I, I agree. There's something, and there's something really fascinating about this. I started noticing with the 2000 election, 2000 Un United States presidential election, the fact that it was so evenly split between Democratic and, and Republican, and that since then it has been that way. And there's some kind of a way that it's not the same as masculine and feminine, but there's something in the polarity of the two ways of thinking, even though they're fairly close together, there's something in that, that that tension, um, <laughs> my, the metaphor that came to mind was that it, it, it feels like as a body where the cell is trying to split. It's like the, the chromosomes are starting to align and the, and, the, and the pulling apart, the tension between it and the, the aligning of the 50-50. Um, and even now, the flipping back and forth between Republican and Democrat um, in the past couple of years. And the Brexit, I mean, there's just interesting stuff that's happening that does look like impact on the level of culture that is trying to get to um, the ability to think more real time. You know, the, the, the way that I've made sense of this is that the complexity of the world that we live in demands a more attuned way of dealing with it. And 
our cultural institutions aren't sufficiently responsive to real world conditions to keep up with it. And so we do keep kind of oscillating sort of wildly back and forth until the until that breaks down and subdivides into something more dynamic. And and the internet is an interesting space that allows for that kind of a thing. Things like blockchain and Bitcoin and artificial intelligence to allow faster um, independent action and, and coordination or, or and, you know, dis dissemination and accumulation that is like, wow, we are, it's when you, when you really look at the pattern of it, it's amazing how much this is not only happening on the individual level, like you noticed, Mike, and, and I'm noticing the same thing, um, but that we're, we're being pushed in a way for our culturally to be able to oscillate back and forth, use both of these two modes of thinking simultaneously. And it's funny what you brought up about the pain, too, because I've experienced exactly that in that process, especially in the last couple of years. It's just been really brutal when it, when you want to do something about it and you can't make yourself not have that desire. And it's just like, you know, knowing that the right thing to do is just to sit there and allow. And then, it, yeah, it's it's a really painful thing. But it, I've I've found that the more I've accepted the oscillation between the states, which I wouldn't even say is necessarily my masculine tendency. It's just the watcher looking at these two states and being like, you know what, they're all fine. Let's just, so there's an acceptance, actually more of an acceptance of the masculine that's happening because that's the part I thought was getting in the way when I was practicing the feminine because the feminine seemed to be working a lot. And I was like, fuck, if I can only get into that state more often, then I would be able to make things happen better or, you know, Duh. and uh but i i've come to appreciate both and that that watcher steps aside and and looks at those two things and allows for them and and the 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 transitions happen faster and it's also a lot easier a lot less pain in between the transitions what i've noticed for myself is the um I'm paying attention to the pain specifically and actually starting to notice the pain as a gift. Um, mm. And the more that I'm able to do that, the less painful it is. It's like I can actually notice the nuance of the way in which the pain is informing me and really inquire, you know, what is it that this is trying to tell me rather than trying to just silence it. Um, if I can, if I can listen to what it's trying to inform me of and and respond to that, um, it it does provide a natural way of doing that, and it makes me think of um, the allopathic medical route of trying to treat every symptom to return us back to normal um, yeah. by giving us a some something that says, oh yeah, we we could treat the symptom, um, and it's like oh, that's so much makes the pain worse and worse because it's you know and it and so it, it, the symptoms we're starting to see in the world make sense from that perspective. You know, we're just, you know, <laughs> the body and the and the personal body and the global body is being and saying, you're going to listen to me one way or the other. <laughs> Eventually, I'm going to get through. Um, and there's something about about embracing that um, rather than fighting it, which um, it doesn't make the pain go away all, altogether, but it does make it much more. Um, palatable and even sometimes I, the thing that's amazing is sometimes whenever I slow down into it the pain almost slows down into a very slow wave oscillation rather than an intense wave and it's almost pleasurable you know so people talk about the difference between um, anxiety and excitement right that those are very short very closely related but the same thing is true of, of other forms of pain that they're that wow if I really slow down this pain Oh, this is this kind of has. I can see the elements of how this is related to orgasm. It's it's much more compressed in a way that makes it un, um, un you know I can't stay with it. But there, but but it's like oh yeah, I can actually listen to what the intelligence of that is. Yeah, I I love that comparison that you're saying on a global level we're doing the same thing as we do in conventional medicine where we're trying to treat the symptoms instead of recognizing that the symptoms are, are a result of an, a process happening 
or uh, some sort of a generator function like Daniel Schmachtenberger calls it. And we're not even looking at the generator functions. We're just trying to, you know, put Band-Aid solutions on things. And now the global organism is saying, like, enough, enough. <laughs> and, and those kind of patch solutions aren't working anymore. Um, that's, yeah, that's such a good analogy. I find it quite interesting swinging this all the way back to the beginning of the conversation when we were talking about the necessity for that pressure um, to to initiate change. I find it interesting that, you know, uh, Cody was was asking, like, why don't we just do why don't we do it earlier? Why don't we like do it smarter? And it, to me, the sort of like cultural, psychological, social breakdown that's happening right now is almost that occurring at a collective level where it's like it, it's like at a collective level, we've recognized the importance of making this change. And now we're, it, the process is un, unfolding where individuals are going through enough pain and breaking down that they have to make that change. And it's manifesting on a societal level as well. But it's like, it doesn't seem like that critical point yet where the external circumstances would demand that. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's my perception. But it seems like we're getting, we're getting a bit of an early warning. And it's happening in this sort of individual and social collective breakdown and, and existential crisis and meaning crisis and all of this stuff we're, we're talking about so much. I think the ex external stuff is happening. It's just not evenly distributed. Mm, yeah. It's happening in other parts of the world where people are getting a very, very, um, you know, visceral feedback from nature breaking down political systems, breaking down wars, etc. Yeah. Or in the Western world with health. Yeah. With with mental health and and complex chronic illness. Yeah. And the, yeah, it's coming. It's exactly that. It's not evenly distributed, and the people who are at the front edge are hopefully going to be pulled towards an adaptive evolutionary move through these constraints, and that will hopefully provide a leading edge for the next wave of whoever gets caught in the next wave of that uneven distribution to sort of follow along with that. It's an interesting- um, David, I want, or sorry, go ahead. Just very, yeah, very quick comment. It's an interesting way to think about these, these people that are getting caught in uh, a mental illness or complex chronic illness or any of these things as you know, the early warning system, the, the immune system in a way, they're the immune cells. So, uh, instead of seeing it as like, oh, it's a problem. No, it's a response. It's an inflammation. <laughs> and the inflammation actually has a very vital function in the body. Yeah. What were you going to say, Heather? Um, uh, I was going to ask you, David, if what you were saying about um, a different way of, of interacting with pain, for example, if, if, a way of uh, explaining that would be moving from a pain state to a pain process. So the pain's not going away, but it's experienced as a moving, cycling, changing thing. It's not a, it's not a state anymore. I think that's that feels right. Um, I, I think of it a little bit differently, but I think it's I think it's compatible with that, which is the um, noticing it as something. So this the, this actually makes a lot of sense from the 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 layers of participatory knowing and um, perceptual perceptive knowing and perspectival knowing and propositional knowing. At my propositional knowing level. I just know the pain hurts and I can do something to make it go away. I can take an Advil or, you know, whatever. Um, but that's completely bypassing the participatory knowing and slowing down in my body is kind of a process oriented and it's sinking back into the process of what actually is happening. Um, that, that is resulting in this and how do I listen to it? Um, 
uh, I think that I think those are those are both very apt ways to describe that interaction. Yeah. And and again, if I back up and look at the cultural, the global cultural thing, it's the same same thing, right? Yeah, I I wanted to add something to that because a couple of years ago I was also dealing with a lot of pain on a daily basis, and it was almost always there in the background. And um, how I was able to deal with it is I would just listen into it very deeply instead of trying to mask it, distract myself or do anything like that. I just stayed with it and the experience of it stopped being so much pain as more like it's a vibration and I was able to tune into it and, and I started thinking of it as like th this is the sound of transformation rather than oh this is pain, this is bad. And uh, by noticing how it was oscillating and what kind of different expressions it had, like thinking of this vibration as a, as a, as a vibration rather than pain, it was it's difficult to put it into words, but it, it really helped because, uh, yeah, like David, like what you were saying before, it stopped being so unpleasant and it became as just listening to a signal and understanding what it says and wh what it's doing because it did change with time and eventually it stopped being painful. I like what you said about when you stopped kind of pacifying yourself or distracting yourself from it and allowed it to become a signal instead of a, a, like something you've applied your value judgment to is bad, needs to be avoided, needs to be stopped, you know. I, I, I th I'm thinking about this a lot lately, like what are, because I'm noticing in conversations with, I don't know, I don't know how I would call it, but it, to me, it's like the old world, my, my old world, like culturally where I came from. I, I, when I talk to family or friends back home, I notice this thing happening where in like average conversation, uh, there's a lot more talk of psychology and sociology and waking up and, and I don't think it's just like a fact that I'm interacting and I'm I'm all into this. I think there's something happening in the culture and the zeitgeist that is waking a lot of people up and people that I would never have thought would be bothering to get into this stuff. But there's that, that key point about the pain thing. And I've noticed the response. I mean, I had a conversation with someone last week where we were talking about psychology and 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 pathologies and, and some of the problems happening in our generation. And this person said to me, um, your generation is, is too focused on finding what's wrong and, and like overanalyzing and trying to figure out all the things wrong. Um, and I thought about that because it's provided like that higher resolution of life has provided so much value to me in, in context. And, and it's been it's not just given me an excuse to become an asshole. It's, it's like, or to become a victim. It's provided so much help. And then this person's response to the discussion of, of like that was providing more resolution was to be like, dismiss it and then go back to the pacification of like TV and, and that kind of stuff. Just like, oh, you guys talk about this too much. I'm gonna go what I do what I always do, watch TV. And it's like, you can tell there's a lot of pain in this person and the way they're dealing with it is to not deal with it. But there's, yeah, I can't help but think like if they just did more of what you discussed earlier, like n turn off the pacification, look at the pain as a signal, look at the, you know, have these conversations more, get more resolution that this would start that engine of self-discovery like we're, we've all been doing and I think in in starting that engine there's I mean I mean it's the beginning process right it's like can you start that engine and then if so there seems to be this track that a lot of people get onto because I've been seeing it happen enough now in like our group chats and like there's there's a a series of steps that people take and it seems to be somewhat formulated formulate but coming from many different angles and it, it, the key process seems to start with that turning away from what pacifies you and, and just looking at what's fucked up. But 
Yeah, that engine that you're talking about is coming back to the the lecture, the yeah. virtual engine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and it requires awareness, and pain is a is a signal. And if you're just choosing to tune it out, then it's like th that's where the transformation is. Then growing pains is actually you know it's, it's a common word, but that's exactly what this is. I think on an individual and, and cultural and global level, we're experiencing growing pains. And if we, if we can tune into it, then that's where transformation is. It's happening as a result of economic change and societal collapse and, and protesting and disruption and all this stuff. Like more and more people are starting to experience that pain and then start, they're starting to question. But it's like there's, there's a tipping point is what I was trying to get to this engine getting started. And it, it's really about self authoring and self directing. Like how much are you going to start taking control of the evolution of your own life and move that needle forward without needing to be pushed by the environment around you. And, but in the environment is starting that fire. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's both. And actually I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if, uh, uh, John Variki has gotten to that uh, by this point in the series because I've already watched a little further along. But he talks about the interaction between the agent and the arena. Mm -hmm. So the, the person and the environment are in this feedback loop as well. There's like an internal feedback loop inside the person, but also there's a bigger feedback loop. And it's impossible to separate the two. So the, you know, there's like some sort of an internal drive to grow and self-optimize, but also there's an external push and mm -hmm. they're working together. Yeah. I, f I feel like, <clears throat> pardon me, I feel like there's something I, I want to bring up here that um, Chris Beasley often brings up, which is this idea that people are sort of exactly where they need to be. And that was something that I was really resistant to when I first heard it, because it can be problematic. It's not a blanket statement, and I don't think she means it that way. But there's something about... Um, I don't want to say this in the wrong way, but trusting that people are feeling into complexity in their own way and that when the time is right for their virtual engine to start, they will know how to start it. And that, I may be wrong about that, but I think it's an interesting thing to consider. I think um, you're totally right about that. Like that's that, that's been the only thing that's, stopped me in as far as like family and friends because i would meddle you know I, I would do that and i did that for so many years and then a few years ago i just stopped and and because i recognized like people will just come on their own and and i've seen it happen enough times with others around me that it's like first of all you can't do it to others it doesn't happen it won't happen it's not even ethical to even try um but since I've recognized the pattern of it continuing to happen over and over and over again in similar ways, it's like, yeah, I, I think most people will figure it out and know how to start their engine with the sufficient amount of external pressure pushing them into that, which is what we're getting. So it's like, I, I think that statement's really good. And it, it makes me think of then too, what you was saying about sometimes when the feminine is at work, it looks like nothing's happening. And those feedback loops are maybe maybe small and slow, but they're there and, and they don't produce results for a long time. And then suddenly like that and everything can just shift for someone. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't even I, say they're the, small and slow. Maybe they're just not externally visible. There's hmm. yeah. Yeah. Again, like if you think of the metaphor of, uh, of pregnancy and birth, it's like, yeah, there from the outside, it looks like kind of something is happening. But on the inside, a ton is happening. It's just not really visible uh, what it is yet until suddenly new life bursts onto the scene and you're like, whoa, where did that come from? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but what was actually happening inside your body with the shift in hormone production is, is, is intense. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how much that th is there. Um, and, it's, and it's from a, a tiny trigger, right? It is um, one biologic event that sets a whole chain of events in, in motion. It also brings to mind the image from the Matrix, um, the, the third Matrix, um, when Neo heads to the heart of Machine City, city when, he's, when he's trying to get there. Um, thing that, the thing that comes to mind about it is 
all of the weaponry that tries to stop him, you know, and it's like been dormant. It's clearly not been used for a long time. Like, but how much machinery is there dormant awaiting this precise moment and trying to respond to the situation? Um, and that kind of reminds me of the body. It's like the, you know, your body UV is just waiting for that, that instance. Everything is there kind of, you know, systems check monthly and everything, make sure it's all good. Okay, now it's happened. Okay, everything's switched. All gears go towards production of life. And, and it's, um, it's just phenomenal that that happened. But I think the same thing is true at a cultural level as well. That at this moment of meaning crisis in our culture, we are starting to wake up. The machinery of this collective sense making that happens as this, oh, we're in a moment now. This is like, I personally don't have the propositional knowing that can make sense of all that's happening that's awakening us. And yet my body does. Participatory knowing down at the DNA level does know, yep, this is one of those moments. We're going in a transition. Everybody get ready. <laughs> <laughs> so good you know we've we've talked about i've talked about that swinging branch metaphor thing many many times down the last few calls and there is that an addition to that story that i recognized um i when we were in thailand doing mushrooms and we were i was literally swinging down and i i couldn't help but be in my head for a bunch of the beginning of it and i would be so clumsy and fucking it up constantly as i was thinking about my physical movements but as, as soon as i stepped out of that and just like trusted i got a lot more momentum and was like using the branches to swing like a monkey and it, and was a lot more agile and and trusting in myself when i wasn't engaged in the intellect at all and i the whole time i was just laughing at myself doing this but um yeah it's it's super interesting how we don't even we have so little experience about being in the body that that kind of intuition is like requires a switch on or like a warming up period like we can't just jump into that right away for the most part. And I think it's the same with game B. There was a comment in the chat of like, uh, you know, game B can't just be about, um, or for those who get it. And I think that's, there's a funny point here because those who get it on a propositional level actually don't matter. Not very much. <laughs> it's because it's about our participatory knowing of how to do it and actually doing it. And that I think everybody already has inside of themselves. So it's more about listening and tuning in. And this is why I was saying it's more like a feminine transformation because mm -hmm. it's like our bodies already know how to do it. And we need to listen to that instead of trying to figure it out intellectually. Okay, like A, B, C, one, two, three, this is how we're gonna play game B. <laughs> and, and Mike, just the same point, right? The more that you are consciously trying to think about which branches to grab, the more fucked up it was, right? It's the actual letting go of the propositional and like, okay, forget it. Just let the body do what it knows how to do. It's like, oh, who's doing this? Like, it's not my conscious mind. It's yeah. not the propositional way of knowing that's doing this. It was so um, funny because I was, we were doing mushrooms at the time. I had this narrating thing I was doing the whole time and I was cracking up laughing because I, I laughing recognized- <laughs> <laughs> what the monkey was doing the monkey was like on its own totally happy swinging from branches and i was narrating what was going on the whole time and narrating the monkey and then recognizing the narration process the fact that i was narrating and just laughing the whole time <laughs> yeah somebody says we need to get out of our own way i think that's very true on both a personal and a cultural global level yeah you you brought up i'd like a bit more clarification about how, why you said it's a feminine process of getting into the body and and allowing because it, i recognized as well in that swinging process this like first of all i recognized how i how much i could trust the body to know what it's doing but also my strength and then i i recognized sort of this I don't know, I, I guess you could say more hunter instinct, like a more, I don't know if you can even call that masculine, but there were, it did, didn't feel particularly feminine, that process of just letting the body, it, it felt like uh, suddenly I wasn't repressing the masculine. That's, a, that's partially how it felt. Yeah, and this is why the, the metaphor of feminine and masculine can be problematic yeah, because everybody okay. has both. 
yeah. inside of them. It's just kind of a way of describing it because the usually the masculine transformation is the hero's journey, which is like going out and ex exercising your will. And feminine transformation is more like pregnancy, which is like allowing and going within until something finally emerges. Right. So. I also wonder if there's some kind of... Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid using masculine and feminine here and use the yin and yang. Yin and yang expression of participatory propositional, you know, all the different layers of knowing as well. Because there certainly does seem like in the moment when you let go and stop trying to direct your action and just let your action flow, that the flow cycle does have a propositional knowing phase of it and a participatory phase of it. In fact, I would say probably it has all, all four of the phases. And that, you know, that's kind of what the Jamie Wheel and the Flow Genome Project is looking at is the phases of flow and looking at it. He does, I haven't seen anybody do the correlation between the ways of knowing and that flow process, but I have an internal intuition that there's something about that that, that goes through the cycle of activating and releasing each of the layers of knowing. Yeah. Sorry, Heather, you were going to say something. Um... No, uh, maybe a while back, I was just thinking when we were talking about game B and the what, how you get game B, and I was thinking about John Verveke's little map of causality A to B to C and how people are seeing game B in that way, <laughs> A, arrow, B, and that that's not what this looks like. It looks like this. And the, the, the yeah. Which is a nice point with what Jordan Hall said at some point, you know, the discussion of, oh, the transition is kind of switching on the gear of the feedback loop kind of going through this, mm. uh, you know, it cycles through mm. and then it adds a little bit more and, it, and mm -hmm. then there's mm -hmm. the enough momentum to switch. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Manifold in the chat is asking where he can learn more about the different ways of knowing that you're talking about, David. They're, they're in the Verveki series. I can't remember which uh, where he really gets into that. I think it's further along in the series. Um, uh, so I, I'm referencing some of the, I think some of the future lectures. Um, that, is, that is a bit he, I ironic, that question though, isn't it? I mean, probably less of the propositional knowing. I mean, that that's kind of the default way that you would learn something if this is the way you're asking. So probably more embodied Mm -hmm. I mean, meditation Practices. or or martial arts or, yeah, mm -hmm. if, yeah, being more right. in flow states. Participating in groups that practice collective intelligence. Yeah. Exactly. This is yeah. This is the th this is the one of the major points. And and uh, you you pointed out earlier the agent arena, um, co, um, arising right of the that we really can't separate ourselves um, from the arena that we're in. And um, participatory knowing is the practice, right? So I, I have a circling practice, a meditation practice, you know, martial arts practice is one of the things that Verveke talks about early on. Um, engaging all of these in a way that uh, as we're doing the con contemplative work, the mindfulness work, the embodied work um, is a very powerful way to bring all of this. Uh, and it, it's, I think the thing that is kind of interesting in looking at this is how subterranean, how um, subconscious the participatory knowing has become. The more that you engage in the practices, it's like, ah, I'm, I'm reawakening it, and it actually sharpens my, my propositional knowing as well. Um, yeah, my, my propositional knowing without that becomes somewhat anemic over time, which lends to a kind of collapse that the law causes, the meaning crisis, you know, it's like, without that full robust stack of uh, full knowing, eventually the, the subterranean stuff will deteriorate to the point that the top has to collapse. And then if there's enough to rebuild it, then that, then that happens. So I think that's um, not, it's not unnatural. That is a natural process. Um, it's the process of growth, as he said at the beginning of this, you know, rather than thinking of it as, a, um, as just a fixed kind of a mindset of doing one thing, it's really responding continually to our own development. Yeah, I, I love that, that analogy you said of the 
you know, if we don't have the full stack, then the, the propositional knowing, which is kind of at the top, like abstract layer is gonna collapse. That's really good visual image, like, and actually it relates to when we say we feel empty inside. It's the, it's the same sort of analogy here because that fullness, that sense of fullness of meaning comes from having participatory knowing of something, not just propositional knowing kind of at the top. And to, to, to speak a little bit to the, um, the, the chat, so the, um, in some of the early lectures in the series, uh, if even like one lecture one or two, um, John talks about the, the way that the shamans approached different ways of knowing and the different practices that they did. And I think all of those practices are still extremely relevant and can be done to develop different ways of knowing. And so some of the techniques were, well, obviously meditation, martial arts, um, also uh, trying to challenge ourselves in how, how long we can go without food, without water, without social contact, like going into nature and um, trying to kind of uh, get away from everyday comforts and see what the body can do. And, and getting in touch with what the body knows how to do intuitively rather than just things that you think you know. Um, yeah, all of those things can, can be used even today to develop that participatory knowing. I think it's also too, like it's really um, important to note the necessity of bucketing all those practices in a community of practitioners or some kind of support system because they can push outside the boundaries of where we're comfortable and what we understand very quickly. And that having a group of people who have, have maybe played around with those practices or understand um, something about them is I think really important for making sure that the feedback loops and circles are moving in the direction we want them to move and not accidentally flipping and starting to move us the, in another, in another direction. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree very deeply and, and want to make a comment here uh, that, that I see often as a confusion and that is missed, um, which is, and it kind of goes back, it ties all of this together back to the point that you made about feeling empty inside, right? That feeling of emptiness inside can be um, sort of a, 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 an anemic participatory knowing. And actually acting in community is a very important way of that participatory knowing to come about um, and relational, but it's, it's, it's actually two parts, right? The feeling of being in community can in some ways act as a relief from the pressure. It can be a kind of distraction of, and I, and I think that there's a lot here going on with um, sexual exploration and polyamory and things like that, where there's a feeling of deep connection, but it's surface connection. It's not deep connection. It's not true deep participatory knowing in this, and it requires both. It's actually recognizing that the experience of connecting is a deep participatory self knowing thing that happens in here as I'm relating to others. And I think that there's something about that that is an important part of community. Um, I, I, this is kind of a subtle point, um, just to, you know, to, to kind of reframe it, just to say it one more time. The sense of the desire to be in community is something that arises when I feel empty. It's like, oh, I feel empty, I want to be in community. If I'm in community, the feeling of emptiness goes away. But that, that, that initial going away of emptiness is the first layer that's just um, treating a symptom of loneliness. If I actually feel into the loneliness below that, the longing, I actually touch into the deeper layers of participatory knowing in myself that is a developmental phase. Um, so it's, 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 um, it's just noticing the way, the layers of this. It's actually one of the reasons I think that these practices are important to do in conjunction with each other and, and as a stack of practices as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's going back to that idea of listening to the pain as a signal instead of immediately trying to pacify it. And also uh, on the point of um, community kind of 
becoming uh, giving us a sense of meaning but it being kind of surface meaning or um, the same with some of these practices where people just kind of dabble and it becomes this sort of badge almost like oh I do the Wim Hof method and I meditate and I've done this many ayahuasca ceremonies and it's just like you know check 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 um, Jamie Wheel talks about that quite a lot of how these practices can in themselves become um, part of really propositional knowing, not participatory knowing. So it's, everything needs discernment. It's like, I, I don't think it's possible to say, oh, just do this, or like, th this is the optimal way. It, it goes back to that, like, we need to develop our own virtual engine to discern where we are deceiving ourselves and where these things are becoming just a checkbox or some sort of surface meaning. Yeah. That's so important because to my comment, you can absolutely be doing these practices in the community and it can turn out to be a cult. So you need yeah. your discernment and you need to hope that everyone else in the group is using theirs as well. I think that's, you've hit the, like the base level of what is the key here. You know, it's it's interesting that a lot of this developmental stuff has happened for me inside of a vacuum. And it's been this like process of rarely getting in touch with my internal intuition. And anytime I do it, creating like a list of character flaws and problems and things I need to work on. And then I Google them and I go practice a bunch of things and, and work on that. But then so rarely come back to that like check-in and um yeah check in with other people or no with just me but I, but the mm. point is kind of twofold here it's it's to say that like you, okay it can be done on your own but it, i i think there's definitely this problem of of check-in that community can also provide as well yeah it's like it's again that feedback loop like they either extreme can be pathological or you know not useful or damaging it's some sort of a balance like if you are completely detached from anybody else and you're doing these practices you can just develop things that are not useful or it can kind of drive you nuts or you can become a person that's just not compatible with society anymore. Yeah. And if you are too embedded in community and you're always needing validation and, you know, you're just doing things on a surface level for like, you know, <laughs> your badge of how, how good of a spiritual practitioner you are, then it's not useful either. And you might be in a cult like Heather says. So it's what is the what's the balance of those things? Well, and you know, as um, this again is referring to a future Rick Becky talk when he talks about the, the set point between signal and noise. Um, this is a, a signal, you know, a balance point between internal and external or um, masculine and feminine or, you know, agentic, you know, the focused versus the diffuse thinking. It is individual for each person, right? Yeah. There are patterns that we can recognize and point to and kind of ask questions about and say, oh, you might try more of this or more of that. And it's interesting because I think culture does have a way of setting an initial start point. But um, we start to see that oh, not everybody follows the same pattern. In fact, each person has their own unique pattern. And that's uh, the, the thing that feels really helpful here is to notice the sooner I can, I don't know, the sooner. <laughs> right. Um, but the, 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 where I recognize it's time for me to notice, oh, this is my individuation stage. I now trust that no one can give me the answer. I'm the only one who really can to notice what it is that I need to do. And some of that is in group process and some of that is in solo process. Yeah. yeah. Yuvi, I feel like you're talking about exactly what Verveke was talking about with Aristotle's golden mean. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, the little, the little point in the middle that we can, we can navigate the whole loop well when we're in that point. I think that's as good as place a place as any to wrap up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so too. Um, thank you guys. I, I really enjoy these little smaller groups, especially with you guys, since we already know you so well that it's really easy to go deep. Um, yeah. yeah. So see you next week for episode seven. Yeah. And awesome. I, I, I'm not sure. When do you guys set the clocks back in, in the, 
North America continent? I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's just keep on track of, of that for next week. Cause yeah, because in Europe, we just did it um, over the weekend. I but, think everyone knows that now. But you guys <laughs> do it either next week or the week after. So anyway, we'll figure it out. Yeah. So next week, it, it'll be at um, 5 p.m. GMT, uh, whatever that happens to be in PST. <laughs> Okay. All, right. All right. All right, guys. See you guys. Thanks, Thanks a lot. chat Bye. for listening, watching, and participating. <laughs>